listener telescopes and eyepieces on episode 408 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris, and joining me is Shane. We're amateur astronomers who love looking up at the night sky, and this podcast is for everybody who likes going out under the stars. We have a uh, Patreon supporter to thank, I think, Shane. We do. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Eric is our newest Patreon supporter. We really appreciate it, and uh, we appreciate all of our Patreon support. So thanks to everyone uh, that supports us in that manner. I think we got to sort out our bills soon. I think I promised I'd do that a couple of weeks back and I haven't uh, gotten on that yet, but uh, thanks to the Patreon supporters, we can pay our bills, <laughs> which is yes. really nice. It is good. It is really nice. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So did you get any observing or any other astronomy stuff in this week, Shane? Oh, uh, the short answer is no, but I was super frustrated. Like, Friday night wasn't too bad here to go out. Mm. Um, temperatures were moderate. Um, skies were okay. But, um, you know, I'm still sort of on the tail end of whatever illness I have. And Friday night, I just had no energy. But last night, I had a lot of energy. Mm. <laughs> and it was clear, but kind of windy. And actually, the transparency wasn't great. So there was I, no transparency. Yeah, I did not bother doing any... Thing other than walking out on the deck, looking at the stars and feeling the wind and going back inside. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Were you well, able to do anything? I was going to go observing last night. I, I sort of got up and said to my wife that, uh, our plans for the afternoon were on hold cause I was, I was going to head out and, uh, but by, by the time one o'clock rolled around, I was like, no, this is like way, way, way too soft. And yeah, I think there's like a weird virus going. Everybody seems to have it at work. I think I have it, but all I'm getting is just like a bit tired, nothing else. So nothing like what you've gone through, fortunately. So uh, yeah, I was like, you know what? I just don't feel amazing. I am going to go lay down for a few hours and yeah, did that and got up and yeah, haven't had any real ill effects other than just kind of being a bit, a bit tired. Went to the uh, Kitchener-Waterloo RASC Center meeting on Friday evening. And that was a lot of fun. It's really cool. Uh, Michael Wright, he's the president there. He's also a, a listener to the to the show. I think he sent us in some some emails recently. We read one in the past few shows. And he, uh, yeah, he was running running that event. And I was just on Zoom. They're of course in in person way down in Kitchener Waterloo. They they made me like a moderating co host, and they had somebody in the room, and I I had pinned like the screen so that it would show like full screen for everybody. Cause it kept like flipping around to other people. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to unpin it, I accident and I was very tired from, from my work week and I accidentally banned that person. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that there was like a little bit of a kerfuffle later on, but, uh, but yeah, they, they did a what's up with the night sky. Michael did. He, he always has some really great objects and then he, circulates it later so i'm hoping if we do get some clear skies to uh to hit some of those they're they're doing some planning for the uh for the eclipse because it cuts through just south of there and uh yeah i mean other other than that nothing nothing too wild still doing some practice sketching at night trying to stay on top of that and i was mentioning this just before we recorded i'm, I'm doing all this reading on planetary nebula i, I really wish i had a big scope to do some more hunting down of planetary nebula. So just sort of trying to get myself organized for that. I might just do a whole, I, I got 78 objects I want to hunt down over the next year. Is that primarily with the big seven inch or would this be in the range of your five inch? Well, some of them are already done like the helix and a few of mm -hmm. those ones, but yeah, I want to, I don't know why planetary nebula, but they're just one of those things. I want to do like a, a good set of them. And so I have like, there's like a set of 78 or a list of 78 that a guy named HD Curtis analyzed back in 1918. It's uh, in like part 13 of the annals of the Lick Observatory. But anyway, if you just Google HD Curtis, the planetary nebula, 1918, you'll, you'll find it pretty quick. It's uh it's an academic paper, but he goes through 78 of these targets of which one of them is like the, um, Messier one or the crab nebula, which is not a planetary nebula, but I think there's just that one, maybe another one that aren't, but regardless, it, it's an interesting set of the best planetary nebula among the best planetary nebula north of, uh, negative 34 degrees declination. So all of those are visible here from 
like where we observe. So I was like, oh, that's just kind of like a neat, a neat list maybe to, uh, to try to poke away at. And Mike and I had tried a couple toughies last fall. And I was, I was thinking, well, once, once I get my scope up and running, because some of these planetary nebula, they're, they're tough to hunt down, even when you get the field. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to think of, uh, of a neat project for like my, my setup that I've got there, but it's not going to be until who knows, it's going to be summer before I'm running hundred mm -hmm. percent. I know, mm -hmm. I know that. So, you know, it'll be a while. So I'm just trying to plan a bit of a project there, but, uh, yeah, I'm kind of rambling a bit now, but I was thinking maybe we would do a short show on that because I think we're going to do a few shorter shows next week. And we have, uh, we had just had, uh, Tim Doucette on talking about his, uh, his observatory and astrotourism, uh, sort of glamping business that he has down there in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. And then next week we have, uh, Mark Radici. I think he's going to come on and chat about his, uh, recent trip to the, uh, winter star party there in Florida. So that'll be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's uh, a star party that's high on my list. And I always enjoy living vicariously through folks that, uh, attend these things and do some observing. So that'll be fun. Yeah. I, I was seriously considering going this year. However, there was, there was a few sort of, you know, problems that I ran into. One is that, and I didn't know this, but they don't put the flights on here until like mid-November so you can't book a flight to that part of the United States until like whenever it is maybe even the end of November even though you're booking a flight maybe as early as as the end of January beginning of Feb so typically that's getting into a high price area but anyway um, that's when you got to book it sometime around the from the beginning to end of November apparently this is what what people told me afterwards so I missed that to start new job it's never good to kind of take off like three weeks into a new job for a week and just general, general, uh, career advice for people out there. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, the other thing is, is that typically uh, you do get pretty sick at that time of year. So, and sure enough, this year didn't, uh, didn't fail to, to wind me up in the doctor's office. So anyhow, that's, uh, that's my tale of woe, but, uh, yeah, hopefully one of these years we can get down there and yeah, it should be pretty, pretty fun. Mm -hmm, absolutely. All right. We've got a couple, a few emails. I think we'll take a read through Bill, uh, who was on the show. Um, he, he wrote in about his sea star telescope. Do you want to take a read of this one? Yeah. The sea star S 50 is, uh, quite popular. I think we mm -hmm. seem to get quite a few emails on it and I see a lot of images online, um, uh, that are captured by this thing. So, so Bill wrote, hi, Chris and Shane, I just listened to your episode number 391 about listener gear, and I'm adding my comments about the usefulness of the Seastar S50. I've had mine since October, 2023. I did mention it very briefly in the podcast. Uh, we, uh, in the podcast, we did about uh, Goldendale Sky Village in November, 2023. Uh, like Roger Dyer wrote you, I really like the S50. I've been strictly a visual observer until now. Uh, the way I use the S50 is just as you each mentioned on episode 391. I use my 8-inch uh, Cassegrain for visual, and I have my S50 set up a few feet away to take photos. Uh, because of the image stacking and enhancing feature of the S50, I can see images from the deck of my house in Seattle's Bortle 3 to 5 skies, which are impossible to see visually. Uh, the S350 is so easy to set up on my deck. I oriented the compass uh, to north and did the leveling just once on the deck. Now, as long as I put the S50 back in about the same place with the same orientation, all I have to do is turn it on and start taking photos. I often will just let it run for 50 or 70 minutes, continually enhancing a single object while I do other things around the house or visually observe with the Cassegrain. Of course, the winter in Seattle and Vancouver uh, is crappy for astronomy, but we do get a clear night once in a while. I've attached some photos below, uh, M31, uh, the Rosette Nebula in, Mon in Monoceros, uh, the Flame Nebula and Horsehead Nebula in Orion, NGC 1977 in Orion, uh, which is the edge of M42 at the bottom, uh, the California Nebula and the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, some of these are virtually impossible to see visually, for example, the horse head. And in every case, you get more detail with the S50. 
Uh, the March issue of Sky and Telescope has a review of the S50, which mirrors my experience in both operation and, and the quality of the photos. Uh, the photos are not as good as a $3,000 plus astrophoto setup, but still wonderful. By the way, you mentioned traveling to the States, uh, Texas, I think, for the total eclipse in March. Uh, Lowell Observatory has rented the Baylor University Stadium in Waco for amateurs, including a program. Tickets are $20 a person and $10 for parking. Uh, impossible to find a hotel room now, however. However, uh, we have an Airbnb for my family of six plus a friend. Uh, keep up the good work with the podcast, Bill. Well, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't wait to hear about everybody's uh, eclipse experiences and all all this stuff yeah people keep asking me at work if if i'm going but uh sadly no or maybe not so sadly because i'm trying to stay focused on my observatory and or if if i do travel anywhere um i'm gonna either go to uh ontario to visit with my astronomy friends or or go back to nova scotia and see family i'm just trying to sort out my my plans right now if i can get the right flights maybe heck maybe i'll do both but i gotta get that observatory finished so mm -hmm. if i end up going in april to this thing that is just gonna totally mess things up nothing's gonna happen right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i'm really yeah. hoping to hear from bill and other people i wonder if he's taken the uh, c star s50 down for that hopefully yeah hopefully that would be a, a neat way to record the event um yeah these s50s are super intriguing. They're, you know, relatively inexpensive, uh, mm. you know, for astrophotography. And I, I just love this idea of it doing work while you can just, you know, do your normal visual observing, or as Bill said, you know, even just, uh, like errands around the house. I think that's awesome. Yeah. We had, uh, I had an email from Will. He, he wrote me personally, I think I'd missed an email from his, I, this is happening. Just, I started this new job and missing some emails or take me a while to get back to people. Um, yeah, it's just been a very busy time and I, I was pretty sick there for a while myself. So we kind of both got nailed at, at different, uh, times. So Will says, uh, hi, Chris, I sent an email to the actual Australian email address about 10 days ago. I thought I'd send this one directly to you. Um, tell me which one is, is the one you prefer. It, they both come to me, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's all good. Um, uh, Thanks. Uh, thank you for reading my email and some notes on on the astronomy books. Uh, I'll try to make this one a little shorter. I put together my second IP set and it looks like I'm set for a while in my budget range. There seems to be several price points for eyepieces and a big gap between the one and $200 uh, eyepieces. Uh, and then you have your like sort of print like expensive teleview and similar cost uh, eyepieces for now, those ones are too expensive for my budget. I began with the stock plossels that came with my 5-inch F5 One Sky Telescope and upgraded to the Paradigm Dual EDs and Celestron XLs, plus an inexpensive 32mm plossel and some of the Svibonis. Those perform admirably in the One Sky. So for getting started eyepieces, those aren't too bad, actually. The... Um, the Paradigm Dual EDs, and I think these are sold mostly by Astronomics, which is the sponsor for Cloudy Nights, if I'm not mistaken, Shane. But I, I, bu I bought a few of those uh, for my nephews for the telescope that I had sent down to uh, to those folks in Nova Scotia, and I've gone down and used those, and they're fantastic getting started eyepieces. I think, not sure if you've ever had a chance to look through those Paradigms. No, I haven't, so can't really comment on them myself but i've heard like a lot of positive things about them yeah they've i think they're about like a 55 degree field of view ish maybe 58 something like that but they have reasonable eye relief it's not exactly what i would want for eyepieces for me because they the eye relief isn't quite long enough when you're wearing glasses but you still get about 50 degrees of that field it's it's close i think the eye relief is like 13 or 14 millimeters i need about 15 or 16. So I just lose a scooch on the edge, but, uh, they're, they're totally usable. Like when I'm down, just hanging out with my nephews, looking through that telescope, it's all good. Like I, I can totally use it and it's, you know, a lot of fun on those evenings. Uh, the Celestron excels. I did have one of those at one point in time. They're pretty decent and the inexpensive 32 millimeter plossel, uh, got that one as well. And those are awesome for the price. 
Will goes on to say, I purchased a 10-inch Daub in 2022 and have now completed my second upgrade set. I would recommend all these for intermediate observers on a budget. I researched all these on Cloudy Nights and they were all recommended by veteran observers attached as a photo of the eyepiece case. Yeah, thanks for sending that. Uh, and so then he lists them. Let's see. The Astrotech 2-inch ultra-wide angle, 82-degree, 28-millimeter. Uh, this is the one two inch I keep in the case. Highly recommend it. And he says that uh, on Cloudy Nights, many people compare it to the 31 Nagler in its views. Uh, not sure. Have you uh, ever taken a look through one of these 28 millimeter, 82 degree eyepieces? Oh, you know, I think, didn't William Optics have one? They did. I think they were the first one that had, yes. had this. And I do remember looking through that and uh, it's quite a nice eyepiece, uh, huge, um, yeah. but a uh, very nice eyepiece. Yeah. I remember the only thing that I didn't care for as much about that William Optics one, and I'm sure these ones may be a slight improvement on that, is that it was so big. On the island side, it was it was difficult to get your like face oriented to mm -hmm. look through it. Uh, but I think there's been some changes and improvements, hopefully. But he says, yeah, they're selling for about two hundred bucks new and gives about forty five magnification in his ten inch. Yeah, and that's exactly the uh, probably very similar ten inch scope. My friend bought one of the eighty two degree twenty eight mils from William Optics, and he had the ten inch, and it was fantastic in that scope. So yeah, that would be a uh, a good eyepiece as long as it works for you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see the Explorer Scientific Argon Purge 68 degree 20 millimeter. Um, he got this on sale for 99 bucks and uh, yeah, it gives him about 64 magnification. I've never looked through any of those Explorer Science ones. No, me either. I've got the uh, 17 millimeter uh, 92 degree, I don't know what it's called. But it's it's the one that you made me buy, Shane. And uh, <laughs> yeah. from from many, so the backstory on that one is that um, when I was doing my master's degree, you, and I don't even think you remember this, but you gave me a copy of like Sky and Telescope, and and I read it. I was like, oh man, and I had given up my subscription, and there's been a few months, and you mentioned there was a good article about something, so I got it and I read it. It's like, oh, this is you know, it's great, you know, sit here and just relax you know, take a, take a night off from studying. And I flipped it over and it had the 12 and the 17. And I was like, Ooh, when I get working, I'm buying one of those eyepieces. And then it was like, you know, years and years later that I eventually bought one, but that, that eyepiece has your name on it. All right. <laughs> the explore science argon 82 degree ultra wide angle 14, uh, again, bought it for 99 bucks. I think I've looked through similar and they are awesome for the price. I have some of those um, more affordable 82 degree eye pieces. I don't know about you, Shane. Uh, have you had a chance to look through any of those ones? I think Mead has some similar ones too. That's what I've looked through mostly. Yeah, I think I remember many, many years ago looking through the Mead ones. I don't recall the view. Again, I think a larger form yeah. factor, if I remember correctly. Some of them. I think the yeah. Explorer ones have kind of slimmed that down. So I think they've generally made pretty good improvements. He also has the uh, 10 millimeter one. And, uh, and then he bought, or sorry, he bought the Astrotech 10 millimeter and seven millimeter ones, which oh, I think I've looked through one of those, uh, again for 99 bucks. Like it's just wild to think about what you can get for $99 us these days and often on sale, or if you buy them here in Canada used, you know, you're under that hundred dollar Canadian price point. It's just wild to think that you could buy an eyepiece that is, you know, within a whisker of a Nagler that's 82 degrees. It It's just mind blowing considering when, when I get started in this, if somebody had one Nagler in their eyepiece set, like, like everybody knew who that person was, you know what I mean? It, it's just mm -hmm. wild to think that everybody's just sort of floating around with eyepiece cases full of uh, similar eyepieces now. And that's just, you know, that's just the norm. Yeah. Yeah. It really, it, like the eyepiece game has really changed in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and the accessibility, um, you know, to nice wide field eyepieces has just exponentially improved. You know, mm -hmm. like you said, you can get into this game now for relatively, you know, little money compared to what it used to be. Oh yeah. 
I mean, I remember when those 4.8 Naglers wrote, I wanted one of those and there were hundreds and hundreds of dollars even used. And now I see them come up for less than a hundred bucks USD. It's just wild. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. It's really neat. Um, and then he talks about the Sibin, Sibini SV Boney. Some people call it 3.8 millimeter zoom, 120 bucks, get it for 99 for Christmas. And uh, people say it rates close to the Teleview 3 to 6. I don't know. I've never looked through this one. I have looked through the Teleview 3 to 6 a few times. Um, doesn't really work well for me, that Teleview eyepiece, uh, because I need to wear glasses when I observe. Otherwise, things are kind of a little bit hokey, unless it's like some sort of really wild eyepiece. But uh, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a, like a good option if people are looking for some higher power uh, in, a, in a Zoom. Yeah, yeah. And having a zoom, especially for higher powers is quite nice because then you can dial that in for almost like the perfect magnification, you know, related to the seeing that you have. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it is nice to be able to just twist rather than have to, you know, take out the eyepiece and replace it five times to go from eight millimeters down to three. And we'll conclude saying, I hope these recommendations will help, uh, other budget conscious intermediate observers like myself. Keep up the good work and clear skies, Will. Thanks so much, Will. Appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate that. It's uh, great to have some insight on different gear because you and I just simply can't try it all. So so it's nice when other people tell us about their experiences. No, and we're not really that into reviewing gear. We just make some mm-hmm. recommendations. And it's really nice when people write in with their recommendations for where they are in their astronomy journey because there's so many people that will be at that point versus wherever the heck you and I happen to be. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wade wrote in with an email. Do you want to give her a read? Yeah. Yeah. I just replied to this one today, I think actually. So, um, or yesterday, uh, Wade wrote, hi, Shane, I have some questions for you. First off, uh, how wide do you go? I know Chris goes super wide, but I believe that you don't go as wide as he does. I'm asking, as I seem to be favoring panning around at slightly higher magnifications for my wide field observing, uh, about 20 times and three and a half degree field of view seems to be a sweet spot for me. Uh, instead of trying to fit the entire object into the field of view all at once. Is this similar to your approach? And my response to that was a little convoluted um, because I think my my process of observing is a little bit different. Um, so right now I'm basically almost exclusively bino viewing, which changes things a bit. Um, you know, I'm limited to one and a quarter inch eyepieces, which limits my maximum field of view. So I think my max with like 24 millimeter panoptics would be about two degrees in the, in the TSA 102. Um, however, uh, because now I'm using also the Nexus, uh, digital setting circles, um, I don't really need the wide fields of view for finding objects. The only time I'd really need the wide field is just to fit an object. Um, so what I've ended up doing is, you know, I, I typically leave like 12, uh, 12.5 millimeter orthos or 18 millimeter orthos, uh, in the bino viewer most of the night. Um, and you know, the Nexus is basically getting me to where I need to be every time. So I don't really miss the wide field and like the 18 millimeter orthos give me close to a degree, about 0.9 of a degree, which does frame most objects that, that I would be looking at. Um, and that's kind of how I travel right now when I'm, uh, observing the night skies. Um, the other thing I did say too, is there's this weird thing, like when you're final viewing, like a 50 degree field of view, uh, a parent field degree or parent field of view, um, uh, actually looks much wider than it would mono viewing and it's far more immersive. So it's, it is really a whole different experience. And, uh, so like I said, it's not a a super direct answer for me, but, um, you know, if I am mono viewing, I'm probably just leaving my, uh, like a zoom in there. And then it depends where I'm at in that focal range as to what the uh, field of view would be there. But Wade then goes on to say, he's got another question. Uh, Oh, I have something to chime in. Oh yeah, go ahead. When Wade said, this is nothing to do with astronomy, but when Wade said, I know Chris goes super wide. I thought of super bad. <laughs> oh, the movie. <laughs> anyway, keep going. Okay. Or not the movie, uh, the little cartoon thing. Is that what you're thinking of? I don't the know. The movie. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> 
Um, okay. Number two, uh, do you know the weight of your Borg 71 without diagonal? Um, I also have a 90 millimeter F 5.6 scope. Uh, it's the SV bony or phony. Uh, it, yeah, I don't know how you say it. Uh, and he says it weighs 2.7 kilograms without diagonal and therefore requires a beefier mount. I'm looking to replace my eight by 42 binoculars with a telescope. Again, not really enjoying them as much as I first thought and want to go as light as possible with a maximum of one and a half kilos so that I can use a standard photo tripod, probably with the ball head in portrait mode. So, uh, my Borg 71, I have it configured for inch and a quarter use. Um, so it has a two speed inch and a quarter focuser on it and with ring and the focuser, um, and a little like kind of Arca Swiss, uh, dovetail. It weighs about 1.25 kilos. So it definitely comes in under his 1.5 max. And uh, I can confirm it sits very well on a standard photo tripod with a, a ball head in portrait mode. Cause that is how I use it. And, uh, you know, it's a fantastic little scope and a, and a great travel scoop. And then the last thing here in Wade's email, he says, not a question, but I think what you noticed when comparing the 30 millimeter UFF and the 31 millimeter Nagler in the 90 was actually field curvature of the scope. Uh, and yes, he is correct. Uh, 500 millimeter focal length is definitely short enough for this to be the case. I believe the Nagler will show you a 20% larger true field and maybe just wide enough for it to bother you. Uh, what you explained with focusing either the outer or inner field, but not both seems to confirm this unless the stars were seagulls or some other not round shape. Just my two cents, clear skies, Wade. Yeah, then he's 100% right. The uh, the Borg 90FL definitely has some field curvature just due to the, the short focal length. It's uh, inevitable uh, when you're doing things like that. So, For sure. Michael yeah. wrote in, he said, I just listened to the Observer's Calendar for March episode and was thrilled to learn about the potential to view Comet Ponds Brooks. Thank you for putting this extra ecliptical activity on my radar. <laughs> the old spell check took that one up, but that's pretty funny. I like it. I found the following article from Earth Sky that includes a nice graphical depiction of where the comet will be, and he sent that in. If people go to earthsky.org tonight slash 12p ponds brooks outburst millennium falcon bright 2024 eclipse they can find it i'll definitely have a pair of binoculars in my hands during the eclipse to carefully observe the corona given the comet's proximity to jupiter it should be easy to find in wide field binoculars if it's bright enough to be visible i think it's worth spending 15 seconds to look for it i'm planning to observe the eclipse from texas where the odds of at least better than elsewhere to have a cloud-free day exist. If that works, I'll report back. Michael. Looking forward to it. Hopefully it That's does work. Pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. And again, yeah, I'm looking forward to hear about all the people's successes and failures in their expeditions because, yeah, it's, uh, I think, like an early spring eclipse could be wrought with a variety of challenges. Like, I remember last year, there was a person who, who wrote in, I wish I could remember, because it was a pretty cool little star party that they went to over in Virginia or somewhere. And they typically went to one just north of them, but they end up having to drive south for, you know, an hour or more because they, you know, just to be slightly warmer because it was so cold. And I feel like they even said it was getting down to like minus five Celsius at night in, uh, you know, you know, around this time of year, right? So... It could be cold. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Tim wrote in from St. Louis. Yeah. And yeah, did you want to give a read of this one? Sure. Uh, hello there, Chris and Shane. It's Tim from St. Louis. I wanted to share with you guys my observing session from this past uh, Friday, the 1st of March. I wasn't sure if I would even go out that night or not because the clouds just seemed like they were there to stay. But luckily around 5.30 or so, I saw they were drifting off, so I packed up and headed to my astronomy park. When I got there, I found a half a dozen or so members of the local astronomy society. Yes, my people. Uh, one of my biggest joys in this hobby is sharing the night sky with a group of fellow observers, and I hadn't seen anyone from the club since November. Mm. It's going to be a good night. 
Uh, I set up and collimated my eight inch daub and then spent some time chatting and telling everyone who would listen about my 20 inch F 3.3 build. By seven o'clock or so, one of the guys had located Comet P12 Ponds Brooks in his eight inch. By that time, my scope had mostly cooled. So in a flurry of no less than three lasers, I got help locating the Comet and put my 38 millimeter SWA into the focuser and started panning the skies. It was super easy to find, especially in alt as, uh, draw a straight line down from Andromeda and to the right from Al Ferrets and voila. Uh, I sat and looked for a few minutes before deciding I should really sketch this. I pulled out my sketch pad and did just a quick and dirty sketch in about five or 10 minutes. Uh, then took it over to share with the rest of the guys. Uh, one gentleman, Jim, and I were able to use this sketch to confirm the direction of the tail as viewed through the eyepiece, uh, almost directly north or toward the seven o'clock position in the field of view. I stayed a few more hours for some casual observing, uh, deciding to just relax with M42, M1, and the Leo triplet. After several months of being stuck on cloudy earth, a night among the stars was just what the doctor ordered. Nice. Uh, yeah. The next morning I took my sketch out and did some final edits and additions and was able uh, to complete the attached sketch. Apart from the comet itself, there really wasn't much to see. Uh, just a few dim stars surrounding the field with the glowing core encased in a faint, short fan shaped tail. Stellarium put the magnitude at about 7.3, still an incredible view and a somewhat rare opportunity to be able to sketch such an object. Have either of you had a chance to view this beauty yet? Uh, I'd love to hear about it. If so, I'll sign off this observing report here and wish you clear skies. So I have not seen it, Chris. Have no, you? No, we just haven't had. I mean, the only times it's been clear was just like un impossibly cold. We went into another cold snap for this new moon period and you, you really couldn't be out there. It was, you know, into, I think like minus 39 with the wind when it was clear, just like, you know, ridiculously cold. So yeah, it's not going to happen, unfortunately. So I was really hopeful for Friday or Saturday night in particular was originally shaping up to be okay, but like it was so soft last night. I, you know, maybe it could have seen, I don't know. I, I think it would have been pretty tough, but, uh, Hopefully we get a night soon. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's now warmed up. So, uh, but I think what happens and what I was noticing, Shane, is that it's evaporating, and uh, yeah, but uh, it's causing a lot of low level haze and whatever. So uh, maybe I'll just read this really quick and then we'll we'll conclude. Uh, Kevin wrote, uh, "Hey Chris and Shane, I just want to let you guys know that I received a new scope for my birthday. I'm beyond super excited. I got a Skywalker 120 millimeter ED APA refractor Oof. on the EQ R6 mount. See the attached photos. The mount is a beast. Yeah, it looks super awesome. That's a great scope. It's not all put together yet, but I hope to get out observing with the new gear this weekend." We are in a bit of a drought here in Southwest Missouri, so I'm sure this purchase will bring in clouds. Yeah, for sure. I also bought a dedicated Astro camera and all the associated gear. Mostly uh, this stuff was back ordered until uh, I guess it's going to arrive later. Of course, this is uh, fine since I need to get used to all this stuff first. Anyway, I'll uh, keep you posted. Keep up the good work on the podcast. Love it. Clear skies, cold beer, Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> thanks so much for this, Kevin. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we uh, we're gonna conclude this one because Shane is is selling stuff to afford an even bigger and better telescope, I'm sure. So uh, unless you have something to add, Shane, no, no, nothing at all. Um, appreciate the observing reports. Please keep them coming. Love reading them. Please subscribe, share the show with other stargazers you know, and send us your show notes, ideas, observations, and questions to actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.